Hi everybody and welcome to my vlog. I wanted to give you a little bit of behind the scenes of this episode before I show you the episode. Whenever I do interviews, I normally let them go about 45 minutes to an hour and then they're going to be edited down to the 20-25 minute, 30 minute interviews that you have seen on my previous vlogs. About years ago, I became acquainted with a stand-up comedian named Erin O'Connor. She was extraordinarily talented, extraordinarily funny, and extraordinarily ballsy, and I've been following her career ever since. Um, last couple years, I actually, because of our paths crossed, I got to know her, and last week I finally got a chance to sit down with her and interview her. It was a thrill to say nonetheless, and as much as I liked talking to her, before I knew it, an hour and 15 had passed while I was interviewing her. And thus, that's too long for an interview, so I had to chop it down to two different interviews. So tonight, you're going to see part one of the interview. The first part is about growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area, her famous father, and her start in stand-up comedy. It truly is a very funny interview, and I hope you will enjoy it. And I'll see you at the end of the episode. Our guest today's life reads like the novel Forrest Gump, and the adventures should belong to somebody ten times her age. She started her life as a stand-up comedy doing the bustle of the 80s comedy boom. She became a seasoned travel veteran working all the major clubs. After a short sabbatical, she is back now with her stand-up hopefully on this circuit yep and she is one of the finest comedians and one of my favorites and the multifaceted Erin O'Connor thank you uh, thank, thank you so much Kyle that was a great thank intro. you I just want to tell you that I've known of your career for more years than we want to admit because that, <laughs> okay. says, how, that says how much <laughs> I originally learned from you from an old radio show called the Alex Bennett show Alex Bennett was a radio don't want to call him a DJ no personality personality in originally from the Bay Area, and I grew up in San Mateo, so okay. that's how I first heard you. And you were on there a, quite a few dozen times. Yep, I was definitely a regular on the show, and mm -hmm. getting chosen to be on the show was huge at yeah, the time. Exactly, you had it's, a lot of power, especially with the '80s comedy boom going yep. on there. We'll we'll get to that in a minute, but let's start at the very very beginning. Okay, you were born in Redwood City, I believe Sequoia High, uh, Sequoia Hospital. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And your mother was an editor? She had a really interesting career. Editor was probably one of her duties, mm -hmm. but she uh, she moved to Hollywood from Ohio when she was 17 to study radio broadcasting. Oh, wow. Wound up working for Howard Hughes. <laughs> <laughs> and your father, I consider Bay Area royalty. Thank you. Um, he was a sports writer for both the A's and the Giants. Correct. The Palo Alto Times and then became the Peninsula Times, or they, they changed the, and merged so many different names, so I don't even know what they settled on. They were, the Palo Alto Times was purchased by the Chicago Sun-Times okay. Tribune, and they became the Peninsula Times Tribune, probably, according to your notes, mm -hmm. uh, in the 80s, I'm guessing, at the Bay Area Sports Writer, and he covered the Raiders and the Warriors, and uh, on his way home from Warriors game, he would stop and watch a Stanford baseball game because he loved sports so much. <laughs> Driving down the 101, he could catch, you know, women's oh, wow. volleyball. Yeah. And <laughs> well, his, his name is uh, Richard Dick O'Connor. After he retired, he became the official scorer for both the Giants and A's or just the Giants? He was employed by the National League, so just the Giants. Oh, he, wow. uh, that's who that's who em employs the, the, <laughs> the official scorekeepers. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you were forced to like sports growing up? You know, it was one of those, uh, yes, we were fortunate enough to be, um, you know, exposed to all sports and some really amazing sporting events. We went mm -hmm. as a family to the 1972 Olympics in Munich, Germany, and Super Bowls and um, playoffs and World Series. So, so it was a really wonderful childhood. But the truth is, mm -hmm. I was kind of already focused on my career goals. So sports was kind of like, eh. And I really became a huge, rabid sports fan that he would be very proud of oh. after he passed away. <laughs> <laughs> Since you had such opportunities, you got to know probably some of the players, they got to know you of that era. Um, did you ever collect any sports memorabilia? 
Oh yeah, yeah, and I still have I still have a lot of stuff from the '72 Olympics. Um, we have uh, my stepmother, who is still with us, has a drawer full of autographed baseballs. My father was meticulous; he kept every single scorebook. Have you ever seen an official oh, oh, yes. scorebook? Oh yes, oh yes. In chronological order, from 1959 until the day he died, and um, my stepmother sold the collection, but. Um, one of he scored catfish hunter's perfect game and my sister made a pilgrimage we call it to the uh, baseball hall of fame in cooperstown okay. and there was my father's scorecard in his scratchy oh, wow. handwriting framed on the wall yeah yeah so, so it's good to know that he is still remembered did you have favorite players growing up Willie Mays and Willie McCovey, of course. of course. My first memory of spring training with the family was in 1965 when okay. Willie and Willie were both rookies. And that's when the, um, the writers used to stay in the same hotel with the players. Okay. Yeah. And so my mom wouldn't let me go in the swimming pool unattended. And she didn't want to take me. And so Mr. McCovey and Mr. Mays said, we'll take her in. So that's my first memory is having Willie Mays on one hand and Willie McCovey on the other. And they walked me into the you know, the deeper end. You attended Homestead High in Sunnyvale. Did you join drama? I took a drama class, but I was not part of the drama, the theater group. Okay. Um, I was, yeah. Well, I, they were always the kids to beat up. Yeah, they, they, you know, we had a really cool school. We were, uh, the cliques existed, but I think we're kind of respectful of one another. And I think mm -hmm. I had like the drama bug, but I was much more interested in journalism. Oh, okay. And student politics. But I, I was involved in a couple of productions uh, on the fringe, and I loved my acting class, and I loved <laughs> my acting teacher, so I think I was in denial. Then you went to um, San Jose State. Yes, I'm pretty sure your father had some very strong opinions about that. Well, I was a legacy, what can I say? Oh, of course you know, you he, he got me in. I mm -hmm. think he pulled a few strings. And um, yeah. <laughs> yes, my father was a Spartan, and I still have all of his old yearbooks. Um, and I made the decision to go to San Jose State at the last minute, and you could do that back then. Okay. Uh, because I wanted to get a degree in advertising, but I didn't know that existed. So I was ready to go to um, San Diego State, and then I found out that San Jose offered that degree. So I switched literally on the night before I was packed and ready to go. And this is what you could do in those days. Hi, San Diego, it's Aaron. I'm not going to be there because I'm going to go to San Jose. Okay, no problem. I mean, it was... <laughs> It was so easy. You mean you don't have to get a signature, transfer it over to the dean, cross it off? Yeah. Nobody cared. Nobody cared. <laughs> but it was a great school, and, I, and I'm really proud that I went there, actually. It was, it was a wonderful place to be. So you decided out of nowhere, hey, let's do stand-up. Let's laugh at ourselves. Not necessarily out of, out of nowhere. As I think I mentioned earlier, I was, mm -hmm. I was, as a young child, really focused on my career. Mm -hmm. And my family, being very, very Irish... Um, there was a lot of humor and a lot of storytelling mm -hmm. and jokes and laughter. And although it was incredibly political for its time and rather controversial, I don't know if you remember the show Laugh-In, you know, it was during the 70s with Nixon and, and all kinds of Watergate things mm -hmm. going on. And my mother was very conservative and she still allowed all three of us kids to watch Laugh-In. Wow. <laughs> and I... I think that Judy Karn of Laffin was probably my biggest influence at a very young age. Really? Mm -hmm. And my sister was sort of the producer of the kids. There were three of us. Mm -hmm. So she wanted to put on the shows. And so she would put me in her shows and mm -hmm. we would put them on in the living room. And I would do Judy Karn imitations. Oh. Real, real young though, you know. And then my parents um, <clears throat> were kind of part of that cafe nightclub society. So they would mm -hmm. go to the Purple Onion in the city and bring home Flip Wilson albums and Bob Newhart mm -hmm. on LPs and I would listen to them and, and I know that that was part of it and the first time I saw David Brenner on The Tonight Show it was probably seven or eight I said that's what I want to do Wow! and I remember it when you say that your family did a lot of jokes a lot of comedy you needed that because it normally covered a pain sometimes of Absolutely. That, who else did you feel influenced by? Man, um, men and women, of course. Well, those are the ones that I really remember from childhood. Mm -hmm. And that's why when I hear people saying, oh, I, 
I need a role model that looks like me. And I think, man, mine was a cross-dressing black man dressed as Ernestine. And yeah. to me, humor was humor was humor. And if, if it made me laugh, it, that was much more of an influence for me, that power of being able to, to elicit laughter. Mm -hmm. So I just thought anybody that was funny was, was kind of a role model. And, yeah. Well, plus also he showed a lot of versatility. Yeah. And because he was able to do so many characters because it was his show, did you find the diversity? diversification you in your talents? Um, it's funny. I I do my characters in the privacy of my own home <laughs> and I have a huge catalog of them. <laughs> but I've yet to sort of bring them into my stage act. Oh. Um, but those are the ones that used to really impress me, the, the commitment to uh, a character. Okay. Um, and so that always appealed to me. And the other part about my childhood that was really influential, because, you know, I, like I said, I, I was really, really young during the laugh-in mm -hmm. period. And then I uh, discovered the show Bewitched, mm -hmm. and I decided, wow, I really like Darren Stevens' job, an advertising copywriter, which well, is... Well, which, which Darren? Oh well, yes, yes, yeah. the new Darren. I okay, was, I was, I like the. You're original. more of a sergeant than you are. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, but Saturday Night Live, when that was introduced, when I was yeah. in high school, and all my girlfriends were at slumber parties, you know, making prank phone calls and freezing bras and toilet papering <laughs> houses, I was alone in the living room oh. watching, and just mesmerized. So, would you say this is how you found your voice? I know this is such a generic cliche. No, 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 it's not. Fine. You mean by watching TV and being influenced mm -hmm. by that? Um, well, I think it was a combination. As I kind of jokingly mentioned before we started rolling, I was the youngest child. And I think that when you are, are wanting to be heard among three other, well, four, four other funny people, my mom and dad included, mm -hmm. you, you got to learn to, you got to learn timing mm -hmm. and you got to learn, you know, what it takes to get attention. And I think that that was just part of being in my family. Wow. Um, and because I was a dork in school, I... I developed a sense of humor for the same reason to kind of compensate for the fact that I wasn't athletic. Um, I was really nerdy and booky, <laughs> you know. And so I think I think it's, it's a lot of things that really contribute. Who do you think was funnier, your mom or your dad? Oh, that's such a tough one. Here's another one. My dad is the best golf tour, golf course joke teller. You know, he can mm -hmm. tell a, a joke joke. And I cannot. I always forget the nun or the fact that <laughs> somebody was, you know, Jewish or whatever. The nuance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, the point of yeah. the joke. I always forget that. But he was awesome at that. My mother has a really good sense of humor. And probably 10 years into my career, uh, I was looking through my mom's yearbook from high school. And probably five or six people had signed her yearbook, uh, Good Luck With Your Dream of Becoming a Stand-Up Comedian. Ooh. Now, that was in, you know, the 40s when... I guess we're still talking about Miss Ma Mrs. Maisel era. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, so that was a shock to me, and we've never discussed it to this day. Never. David Letterman is notorious for saying that he loved to do stand-up at the Comedy Store in mm -hmm. the late 70s, and he just felt so empowered, so in control, until this guy came along named Robin Williams, and he said he just felt like getting run over by a train. Oh. It just took the wind out of him, and everybody would just stand up, walk to the side of the room, and just watch, just to um, feel the empowerment of such a force. Who was the force during your, during your first reign, I'll call it? Thank you. Well, Robin was still, you know, mm -hmm. around in San Francisco, and he was already very successful in films, but he was still around, and, and I think everybody looked, at, the, the world stopped spinning and everybody yeah. watched and paid attention. Um, but I don't really have that frenetic, manic style, so when I see a really uh, talented monologist, uh, I, I am really impressed with uh, word choice, craftsmanship, the way to structure a joke. Mm -hmm. So when I see someone like that, I uh, I stop and marvel and say, all right, I give up. That you know, we all have those <laughs> moments. But I was thinking about that this morning, and and I think um, you know when I when I finally made the decision that comedy was what I wanted to do. I saw someone on a very popular television show from the '80s who has to remain nameless because because they're in hiding. Yes, yes, yes. And I saw him, and I said, wow. That's the kind of comedian I want to be. Okay. So I had some someone that I wanted to aspire to. It didn't really 
say, ah, oh, I, I could never do that. Okay. And I'm, I'm not at that level by any <laughs> stretch, but, but I was always um, kind of, I just love comedy so much. Yeah. And like acting, you know, you see a great actor and on screen and you're blown away. And that's why we do this. I, mm -hmm. I don't watch a lot of comedy, to be honest. People mm -hmm. will say, hey, did you see that special? My friend sent me Wanda Sykes' uh, latest special oh, yeah, okay. last night. It's supposed to be fantastic. It, but it, it, yeah. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's for me, it's like, I, I, it's hard for me to sit for an hour and focused on watching comedy now. You said monologist versus stand-up. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a boom going on that everybody who was doing stand-up called themselves a one-person show. I know like Rob Becker did Defending the Caveman and such like that. Where does the line cross between stand-up and one-person show? Um, I... I most of my material is based on real life, mm -hmm. a little bit exaggerated or, uh, you know, a, some poetic license, of course. Of course. Yeah. But it, for me, it has to be based on real life. I don't know what else to talk about. <laughs> I can observe and observe and report, but when I'm on stage, uh, it just has to yeah. be about me. What can I say? <laughs> um, but I have... I've. I've seen a lot of one-person shows. I've been blown away by a lot of one-person shows. I um, I hope, I think it's just a little more revealing, a little more okay. intimate, and um, you have to, first of all, trust that, that whatever you're about to put out to your audience is gonna have all the elements of, of mm -hmm. you know, entertainment and, and humor and pathos and probably, <laughs> you know. Uh, I believe that you didn't get this from the advertising job then, the pa pathos and, <laughs> I'm assuming that I this, got this you twitch, know. <laughs> you know, do you see my, the yeah. tick, I got the tick. Did you find doing stand-up empowering then? Um, I kind of just found it really fun. I mean, I, um, Mm, that would be the word. I love performing. I, I absolutely love being on stage and entertaining people and making them laugh. And, and you know, I never really had a, much of an agenda. Um, I, I, my political humor, we'll just put this, my political humor does really, really well on Facebook and just dies. Slow. It's like a thud. But yeah, I never really um, had a lot of depth, I guess, in my, my stand-up. Would you consider that a niche for you? For you or uh, shallow humor? Yeah, sure, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> well, it's funny. I I had a discussion, um, you know, because during the '80s, the boom that we're talking mm -hmm. about, I went from San Francisco and I moved down here really, really quickly because I got a fantastic job opportunity and a production deal and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And the feedback that I used to get was, mm, she doesn't, or she needs a point of view. You got to have a point of view. Mm -hmm. And I always thought, I don't think I have one. I'm pretty sure I don't have a point of view. But it's sort of inherent when you're you're a particular age and a particular gender and you're up there on stage, then that's how you see the world. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it is. And so I didn't really work on that. I didn't say, I have to get a point of view now. <laughs> and then maybe two or three years ago, I was having lunch with an old friend who was my comedy coach in the day. And I told him that he goes, you absolutely had a point of view. You did. So maybe it's just one of those things that... Um... Well, remember Bob Saget at one point had no act, and that was his act. So maybe that's yours. Well, I have an act. I, like I said, you know, I really love structure and form and punchlines. I had a, a, an up-and-comer come up to me after a show a couple of weeks ago, and he goes, Okay, so it seems like your jokes each have a punchline. And I said, Well, that's, that's the goal. And he goes, Huh, that's, you know, that's fascinating. <laughs> Like he's dissecting every word you're saying, each pause. Each... Well, some people, and now it's kind of a trend that I'm noticing that, that a lot of people just sort of do a lot of storytelling. It's not necessarily okay. intimate like a one-person show, mm -hmm. but it's sort of like the story I told you about how, you know, what happened to me when I yeah. woke up this morning. And then that's kind of it. It doesn't yeah. necessarily lead anywhere, so. Bringing back the 80s uh, comedy boom that yes. you were discussing, everybody was getting a deal. Yes. Was that your intention? Never in a million years. No, it wasn't. But it happened. Yeah. Um, and that's that was a really. Uh, I, it wasn't hard and it wasn't painful. The lesson, but it was a lesson, because my personality is I find something I love. I get really really enthusiastic mm -hmm. and I put my whole heart and soul into it. And as a result of that, people were offering me things that I wasn't prepared for. Mm -hmm. And when I was called down to Los Angeles to have the big meeting, um, I was, uh, and it was a great, it was a big meeting. It was a mm -hmm. big, big meeting. 
and I got there because he had seen me do a stand-up show uh, filmed in San Francisco, Good Time Cafe. Ooh, okay. Do you remember it? Uh, uh, Bill Rafferty. Yes, yes, Bill Rafferty. Um, and so I get to this big fancy meeting in this big fancy office with a big fancy guy, and he hands me a script. And I, you know, like I said, I, mm-hmm. I'd, you know, I'd been involved in drama this much. Mm-hmm. I can still remember my lines that I did in the third grade play, a Spanish version of the uh, the Pied Piper. <laughs> que triste estoy, el flautista de Amalí. <laughs> Abominate. Uh, apurate, apurate. Uh, <laughs> but I had really no experience, and I didn't know sides from a script or anything. So he hands me this, and he goes, let's read this. It was a scene from Baywatch. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I was so flattered. Yeah. I thought, oh, that's exciting. So I laid out my imaginary beach towel, and I started rubbing on my imaginary mm-hmm. suntan lotion while I'm reading the lines in my pantyhose and my pumps from the 80s and my big hair, because I didn't know. Mm-hmm. And, and they're looking at you like, what's going on down there? Yeah, but what, I didn't know, you know. So uh, that's when I decided that I needed to take this acting stuff seriously. I I studied with some amazing actors. I mean, teachers when I got down here, mm-hmm. and I so I I wanted that in my arsenal, and I did get very involved in acting and studied it nice. very seriously. So I was, you know. Okay. So I, and I had some luck with acting. Here's the depressing, serious uh-huh. question. Okay, here we go. Oh. At some time, you probably were getting so frustrated with stand-up. You said, why am I doing this? Maybe you bombed, dare I say, even once. <laughs> there were a few. Okay. Um, what kept you going? Again, I just loved it so much. I, I used to say, um, you know, I get to see the world on somebody else's dime and get paid for it and lo- do what I love doing. But it, it is an exhausting way to make a living just just to travel yeah. It, it, oh, yeah. it gets to you and when i got married to another comedian um it we traveled together quite a bit mm-hmm. and that was wonderful but i think as you get older you i i i really wanted um kind of a more of a home base okay. stability so it was it was challenging making a living just staying in los angeles so i, I kind of like tapered back Okay. And then the acting started to get take off. Okay. So for me, it was kind of a natural progression. It's like, well, if I'm on the road, I'm kind of exhausted and sad a lot of the time. Yeah. And if I'm home, I'm going to be able to pursue this acting with a vengeance, which I did. And so it was okay. And, okay. and um, yeah, I, I never hated comedy and I never hated doing it. Here's a, an important question that every Bay Area person needs to ask every other Bay Area <gasps> okay. question. Why are the Giants having a bad... Okay. That comes later, actually. <laughs> Every Bay Area native needs to ask this to everybody oh, okay, else. Okay, 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 yeah, I'm ready. October 17th, 1989, 5.04 p.m. Where were you? I was driving over the, a bridge from Long Beach back to Los Angeles to watch said game at Mother's Sports Bar on Wilshire Boulevard. And then you heard and... Well, uh, you know, my father, the sports writer, yeah. I knew he was in the press box. I knew okay. he was in the stadium with my entire family was in the stadium. My father was in the press box. And as you know, the first news was shaking mm-hmm. of, the, of the press box. And then I got a phone call from a friend of mine who said, the Golden Gate Bridge fell into the bay. That's the first thing I heard. The Golden Gate That's Bridge. That's what she said. But it was, you okay. know, it, yeah. it was early reports. Okay. Because nobody knew what was happening mm-hmm. because all the press was at the World Series. So as the dust settled, um, all your family was fine and they were fine they were fine but it was you know huge huge turning point yes and we still lost two more games yes <laughs> yeah we sure did but you know i had only lived down here for a year so that was the other oh, okay. strange thing it was you know you kind of want to be there and then you're happy and grateful that you're not so. what is so groundbreaking about san francisco comedy that made it so iconic and to another extent still produces generations of the the comics. Well, for me, again, it's kind of the fishbowl thing. It's all I knew. Mm -hmm. Um, When I worked in advertising, I would get off BART and I would walk down Battery Street past the green awning, the iconic green awning of the punchline, and on my way to my miserable job. So I I feel like, fatefully, I was in the right place at the right time, and Mm -hmm. I don't think... Uh, well, I, I really don't know, but I felt that the San Francisco comedy community was, um, a, it was so luxurious because I give a lot of the credit to the crowds and the audiences mm-hmm. who would pay money to go to an open mic night. 
and they wow. because they knew that mm -hmm. Robin Williams might drop by or Paula Poundstone or mm -hmm. you know uh, all kinds of people would Dana Carvey you yes. know it was it, there was always a crapshoot um, that you would get a star walking in when we were working out but I felt so welcome from the very first open mic and I haven't heard that from other people who came up in other cities, yes. that it was very competitive and that the club owners would really make you suffer before yeah. you got a chance to go up and get some stage time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm finding that in Las Vegas that is kind of true right now, oh. that a lot of the smaller clubs in Las Vegas are just really encouraging and saying, get up here and work. Well, it's partly because there's so many different um, comedy clubs that are opening again in Vegas. Correct. Yeah. When Kimmel has a comedy club, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But but I, to, just to really answer your question, I just felt like um, it was there was so much support from the club owners. Yeah for cultivating talent and if you would go to an open mic on a sunday night at the punchline you would actually see people uh really really dedicated and working on their craft uh, and that that was it for me so also is it funny living in the bay area probably not back then because uh um you know silicon valley was still an underground movement yeah. and san francisco wasn't it was getting yuppified right when i was starting mm -hmm. out um, but no, no, I don't really think that was particularly an influence. I think it was more just, um, like I said, nurturing and nobody's going to make fun of you or not hire you because you're taking a risk. The San Francisco comedy community has reinvented itself. It started with, may have started with like Robin and, um, gone to Margaret Show, Greg Proops, Margot Gomez, and now it has, uh, W. Kamala Babal and Ali Wong. Do you feel that you are known for one particular thing. Oh, she, oh. she empowered women. Oh, she empowered somebody. She, what was your footprint? My footprint was a, a baseball joke that had a really great callback. And it was about, <laughs> I had like a signature joke mm -hmm. that I didn't really realize I had. And it was about Bucky Dent. <laughs> and um, I, I made it up based on true life of having a father that was, you know, knew all the sports trivia. Mm -hmm. And I kind of just based it on that and I moved away I wasn't in San Francisco for very long I mm -hmm. mean I started in 1986 and I moved to Los Angeles in 88 so that's that was not a long time to yeah and that's from my first open mic okay so um, I'm not sure I left much of an imprint I still have a million friends who remember that joke mm -hmm. my comedy coach uses that joke in his class <laughs> as, well just to, to, to illustrate what a callback is and okay. if your audience doesn't know what that is it's you you, you kind of give the punchline away during the joke and then it comes back to haunt you After like, another, oh, later yeah. on. Exactly. See, I don't even know how to explain it, but I did it somehow. Yeah, that was fine. I wasn't intentionally <laughs> doing it. But then people will see me now and say, uh, you know, oh yeah, I remember that Bucky Dent joke that you used to do. <laughs> I was working in Little Rock, Arkansas and I told the joke and the woman in the front row in Little Rock, Arkansas, Bucky Dent's my cousin. We have Thanksgiving together every year. <laughs> Wow. And so, so I mean, I, that's not my, you know, my footprint. But it's, I guess it's, you know, what I'm famous for. Yeah. The Bucky Dent joke, and people send me photos of Bucky Dent, and um, uh, so maybe. But, but um, the other real quick story, you know, because we had Warren Thomas and Rob Schneider and yes. Dr. Gonzo and Bubbles Brown and. Um, you know, it was just a fun group that was so diverse. I mean, we were all doing really different mm -hmm. things. Um, and somebody wrote me a note recently and, and said that at Warren Thomas, who has passed on, uh, yeah. at his memorial service, he, uh, one of the eulogizers got up and said one of my favorite things was, I have, I have a very distinctive laugh, very. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, one of my favorite things about Warren is that he would be in the back of the punchline with Aaron O'Connor and I could hear them laughing <laughs> at my jokes and I always knew it was Warren and Aaron. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be my footprint, maybe, is my laugh. And you know, Warren would probably <laughs> love that, too, considering... I know, he yes. would, he would. Yeah. So I think I loved watching my fellow performers perform. Uh -huh. And I kind of was known, like, as a cheerleader, kind of like mm -hmm. a Pollyanna, you go. And, you know, <laughs> I, I really wanted everybody to, uh, mm -hmm. to do really well, and that was kind of like, what's wrong with her? <laughs> yeah. That is the first part of the interview. Next week on July 3rd, we will be releasing the second half of this interview. Erin discusses how she finally found love, her taking a short break from stand-up, 
her amazing philanthropy and her return to stand-up. Before we go, let me give you some information about Erin's upcoming gigs. Next week, she is playing over at Cobb's Comedy Club for one show with Kabir Singh. That showtime is scheduled for 8 p.m., one show only. Later in the month, Erin will be performing over at the Ice House in Pasadena for the Clean Comedy Challenge, where she will be a judge and performing a short set. Also performing will be Bob Zaney, her husband, and the legendary Jimmy Brogan. Showtimes for that are going to be 8 p.m. as well. And the address is 24 North Mentor Street in Pasadena. If you want to reach me, email me at askkyliequestion at gmail.com or you can reach me on the socials. But until next week, from Hollywood, that's a wrap. the iconic green awning of the punchline and on my way to my miserable job in Everton. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That one's too loud for me. <laughs> okay, I'm um, sorry. No, 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 no. It's, are you flying the plane? Yeah, we're fine. Yeah, I'll get a little remote control. It's fine. <laughs>